Welcome to the second episode of The Serpent and the Star, a podcast on theistic Satanism and occultism based on the philosophy of the Star of Azazel. This time we'll talk about the seven principles, what they are and how they relate to the classical planets and their corresponding fundamental archetypes. The discussion is going to be split in two parts, two episodes, so that this first one covers three principles and the second part the remaining four. We can mean several things when talking about principles, but in these discussions they mostly relate to the septenary system which comes from theosophy and which has its roots in Indian metaphysics. Thus we also use the Sanskrit terminology. As these esoteric philosophies teach, the principles have to do with human constitution, or the microcosm, as well as their macrocosmic counterparts in nature. We'll go through these seven basic archetypes and principles and some of the correspondences. We'll also read the Star of Azazel hymns, or daily prayers, each dedicated to one of the seven rulers. A lot has been written about this subject already in Star of Azazel writings, such as the book Phosphorus or the article The Composition of Man, both written by Johannes Nefastos. Phosphorus might be quite hard to find at the moment in English, but the article is currently available on the website azazel.fi, which is run by Lodge Graal. Some of the SOA hymns and their commentaries, along with many other useful articles, can be found at lodgesalome.com. And for Finnish readers, there are lists of correspondences, for example, in the grimoire and prayer book Azazel in Avain, the key of Azazel. We'll start the episode again with the Agape prayer. Beloved Master, in you we trust, in your name we have joined together. Ubi enim sunt duo vel tres congregati, in nomine meo ibisum in medio eorum. So be with us, Master Lucifer Christos, and send to our hearts and into our communion the Holy Spirit that fills the life with meaning. In trust, let us rise our hearts into brilliance, Frater et soror, at sacra mysteria celebranda. Verily. Welcome again, Sister Polyhymnian, Brother Nefastos. Uh, today we will talk about the seven principles, and uh, I thought that first we could talk a little about the seven, uh, which is quite a common holy number in different different traditions and why why uh, why it is so and how this seven is kind of a or can be seen as kind of a continuation of the three or the holy trinity or or an extended uh, number three in a way mm, maybe we could say a few words about uh, the emanation theory which is i would argue quite common also in in pretty much every religion and esoteric worldview in some way or another basically the idea that there are some basic forms and out of those forms um, more and more nuanced and defined forms appear we can see that there is a kind of a absolute state that is or can be symbolized with the number zero, and then and that, that that is like the state of total harmony, where there is nothing but the absolute itself, and and it's something that is pretty much out of our comprehension already. And the Hindus, for example, use the word parabrahman or chit about it, and then the act of creation is uh, also kind of the first crack in the harmony or or the absolute, and there we have the number one, which is in a way already also number two, because number one is only something in relation to something that is not <laughs> number one. And then then uh, we get the trinity when we have these opposites, and the aspect that is kind of between those, and also leads from, from uh, or, or, or the link between those. So that is kind of, or one way to look at the first, first trinity and why, why the holy trinity is such a common concept. And we discussed this last time already. So kind of one, maybe one more 
explanation or idea to that. And then we can see that the Trinity has its counterpart. We can talk about the higher and the lower Trinity. And then the seventh principle is the point between those. And that's how we get to the number seven, which again is, as said, a holy number in, in many cultures. And we could say those are kind of the first forms in a way that all forms after that come back to and the seven then go back to three and that goes back to one and that goes back to zero and and so forth but that's my attempt to summarize this this or the importance of this number i i think that many people who know occultism and occult pictures have stumbled upon eliphas levis picture where there is this uh, white king above forming the white triangle and his reflection upon the waters of Maya or substance matter uh, which is the inverted triangle the black king so these two intertwined triangles are the spirit and matter and then the seventh point is the point of their Uh, meeting the vitality jiva uh, essence energy that binds those two worlds together and of course since the second triangle second king is only reflection there is actually just one world but we must um, face it this way to see like there would be two opposite realities and then these seven seven first forms or uh, principles aspects deities even they can take many many forms in different cultures they have correspondences to the seven uh, classical planets um, and then Uh, in the star of Azazel, we uh, mostly use the Sanskrit terms that um, are found in Hindu theology, of course, and then later they were um, taken to theosophical worldview, and then our our septenary system is is based on that heavily, but also has some different interpretations just like the theosophical interpretation has some differences to the old hindu meanings of the words but this is i guess understandable so also because uh, well these are so vast vast things that they can be interpre- interpreted in many ways and looked at in in very different lights this is a very vast subject and uh, I was thinking what would be the what would be the best way to try and grasp this and uh, I thought that we could use our our society's prayers as the backbone of the episode mm. because um, we have these seven celestial hymns that are directly um, dedicated to each of these these uh, divine forces so to say and there are many possible paths that we can take by looking at this these hymns so we could read those and then go through the hymns and uh, our own experiences and feelings about them and then also go to these correspondences and uh, I just thought that like if we recorded this episode a month from now or even tomorrow this could be a very different outcome uh, but I, I hope that we can manage to get some kind of a overall representation of, of these things it also sounds like a microcosm of the whole idea of the celestial hymns those seven hymns for the seven days of the week and their governing spirits or deities 
because that's how the star of other cell member is supposed to find those meanings uh, in one's spiritual journey by reciting these texts uh, every day, every week, of course, not necessarily. Um, but it's possible to go through these cycles over and over again and find what these archetypes, spirits, mean to each of us personally. So, of course, it's a thing that changes, but we can find some kind of a essence behind those differing ideas. Yeah, the first question that comes to mind now actually is, is do you see these archetypes or principles as deities or gods? Could it be is it in that way? Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, they represent like very real um, deities in their archetypal form. But I definitely feel that there's distance between certain ones and ones that I'm closer to. Um, and I don't really know quite how to bridge that gap with that distance. Um, like, say, for example, with our Tuesday hymn to Mars, uh, I feel very disconnected to that, even though I work within the red aspect right now. And I'm trying to figure out the ways to, because uh, I see that energy as being so masculine and for myself, I always thought that I was more of a, a masculine type of, of um, woman identifying person, but the prayers have really shown me that I'm very disconnected from that masculine side. And it wasn't until I started do doing the prayers daily over you know a number of years now, a couple of years, that I've really realized those um, chasms, as it were, um, in between some of the archetypes. So even though I do see them as deities, there are ones that are... I'm just not very close to yet. And I think that maybe just consistency and practice is what gets you there. Uh, yeah, I really am lost about that one. It's very interesting to hear that you consider the Tuesday him be, being like almost too masculine for you, because even though the Mars is the most fundamentally masculine archetype of all, or is usually seen that way, uh, I've considered that how the Star of Azazel hymns um, faces approaches the Mars archetype is more f feminine in a way than it's usually like how it's usually approached be because uh, in Mars mm, people most often see this warrior mentality this uh, masculinity in a way that uh, triumphs in um, man's uh, usual behavior but in our uh, hymn this masculine behavior is inverted the uh, sword impales oneself and not any enemy or uh, dragon-like thing like it's usually done in these archetypal forms so I, I have personally considered our Mars like a more feminine aspect of that planet. But I, I definitely understand how, how you feel about that, that it also has this basic masculinity. There is this sword, after all, that's been put somewhere and that's a masculine thing. About this question about gods, I guess we will get to it anyway as we progress and it's a, it's not a very very simple uh, answer for sure although that that question about whether we worship gods or consider these things psychological archetypes it's one of the most basic common questions that is being asked from the Star of Azazel members, as far as I know. And it seems all, always like a letdown when I try to say that, yeah, it's like both. So you shouldn't think it uh, that it's either this or that, because the whole occultism operates on a level where those merge. Uh, things are conscious uh, in different way than human being is conscious 
so we we don't believe uh, deities that are human like and we don't believe that it's only in your head in a psychological way but something uh, which is the third option and even if we find uh, the discussion or thoughts about god or gods uh, fruitful it's like it's not very obvious like if if it's wiser to talk about serving a god or many gods like the hierarchy of gods is not very <laughs> very uh, obvious either and i guess if we think of these seven as gods or if we think that they are that there are some like minor more minor gods under them and then these seven again are minor to some higher form of god it's it's like a it's an answer once again that that uh, escapes the rational mind as we usually see it but i think what what you said uh first about the emanation in the esoteric world view how this zero becomes one and one is actually two and those become three which is the first uh, geometric shape which can be sensed uh, and which then becomes by reflection the six and seven uh, i think that it explains if we think about that this plurality of divinities uh, if you are a christian you just think about one number one there is one god but if you are esotericist you think about this whole process of emanation what is god how are those several gods or god attributes uh, affecting the world us how they are in the oneness all the time these are very difficult but also very important questions for an occultist okay before this goes too too heavy let's let's go to the um hymns i didn't make any system like who reads what uh, but we can make such as we go if we go chronologically starting with the monday's hymn Do you have any preferences on which you would like to read? I have no preferences. And you, you neither. When then, as as the host, I will dictate that. Johannes, could you start with the Monday? Okay, my pleasure. <clears throat> o holy moon, white maiden, the friend of the sorcerers and the foe of the unwary, hear my sigh. You who are my beloved and my mirror, the depth of the pure power, Magna Mater. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, vita dulcero et spes nostra salve. Adoro pietatem et misericordiam tuum, adoro beatum uterum tuum. Adoro beata ubera tua, que lacta verunt salvatore mundi. You who are forever unblemished, Harthan, Milalu shed barshemo chartatan. You are the sacred primal sea. You are the temple of perfection. You are the dew of the tree of life. You are the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Lilith, Hevach, Hasmodai, mistress of the night. Gaude virgo immaculata dei genitrix. Gaudium mihi dona. Gaude que gaudium ab episti. Et gaudium visionis divine mihi dona. Gaude, que genuisti eterni, luminis claritatem. Amen, amen, ameth. I'm glad that you, you gave me that uh, Monday part, even though usually I feel very strange when reciting the hymns that is not about that particular day, day's hymn, because I have been so uh, programmed to listen only, only to that day's hymn. I have been feeling so especially connected to the goddess archetype in the last few days so it felt very very uh, good and sacred to use that prayer right now what is your relationship with the monday hymn or the archetypes 
Well, as I touched about how difficult, um, like, Tuesday's hymn was for me and some of the more masculine archetypes, this one automatically resonated with me, um, which I had been kind of surprised because my difficulties uh, with any kind of mother archetype have been consistent my whole life. So I'm not sure if that's just showing like a psychological craving to be closer to that type of archetype because it's been lacking in my life in various ways. But it's definitely one of the hymns that I feel the closest to with the second being the hymn for Friday, which is also, I find quite a feminine hymn. Um, So yeah, this one's one of my favorite hymns. I'm I'm very glad to hear that because uh, because nowadays we are often quite sensitive about these uh, sexual archetype themes, and this is so like um, it's most traditionally feminine hymn and uses the old, old uh, partly Christian way of worshiping the actual womb and breasts of the mother of god so it, it i i wouldn't have been surprised surprised if you as a woman would even felt somehow offended or felt that it's too too much about these like too obvious masculine type ways of seeing the feminine but I, i'm glad it wasn't so for me actually the Exactly the same thing as you said, Polohymnia, when I joined the SOA, and probably even before for that, um, I always felt a very instinctive and strong connection with the Mo- Mondays hymn and also the the Fridays hymn to Venus or Lucifer. And uh, yeah, the, it, it has been so, so very early on. Um, Also, it is not not at all uh, for granted that that uh, we in in the West see see a feminine female deity as the one that we uh, direct our prayers to, and that has been personally very very important shift in my my own self that I have. Sometimes, uh, in the la- later years, then felt that it is it is much more honest to worship the goddess than some um, male image of a god. It is in a way a very simple thing thing when you think about it or say it, but but like energetically, in, inside yourself, it can be a very powerful shift. Even though I have shifted a bit towards the more masculine archetypes in the later years, uh, I think this might also be why we three are here talking about in Salome podcast, uh, because we have all felt these Monday and Friday feminine and partly feminine archetypes so close. That's after all also the Salome Lodge's idea about the most emphasized archetypes as you can see we here talk about the mondays hymn which already shows a correspondency and and uh, these hymns are dedicated to each of these principles and also their correspondences are in the days and each hymn is uh, best read on certain days which for this one is obviously Monday. Uh, and other correspondences include the moon. And uh, we were talking about these Sanskrit terms and theosophical terms, the linga sharira, or... Well, how would you describe linga sharira? That might be the hardest principle to <laughs> discuss pre- briefly, but... Uh, it's the energetical body of man, the physical body, but not the crude physical body as anatomy dissects it, but the magical physical body of man. And that is one uh, example of differing interpretations 
with theosophical tradition because isn't it so that in theosophic in the theosophical septenary uh, the so-called crude or gross body is among those seven yeah. various uh, in our system it's it's precisely the more subtle body the that we mean so-called stula sharira or the crude physical body is part of the exoterical theosophical system but in her esoteric instructions uh, Helena Blavatsky gives this particular system that Star of Azazel uses nowadays so in that system there is no stula sharira present although there are some uh, slight different differences but we can <laughs> come back to those later anyway it gi- gives kind of new meanings to what corporeality means uh, for example i don't feel that i have been especially in the past very uh, body oriented corporeal person and it has started to shift then later on not least because of this idea of linga sharira and that the idea that our gross bodies are some kinds of reflections of this actual bodies that uh, that that is a much stranger <laughs> concept of this kind of etherical body that is not obviously visible and and so on are you like traditionally corporeal people yourself or how would you describe your relation to corporeality and like bodily experience or i don't know how would phrase this best this is a, a complex answer for a complex question mm. but um i definitely think that i used to focus a lot more on the gross body as it were and really take care of that in the sense of you know exercising well getting sleep not always um, i had a pretty sordid past where i didn't do those things but once i became uh, an adult and you know you start thinking about those things and taking care of your body i would say that i was a very healthy person you know ate properly go to the gym etc but recently over the past six or so years um, i have ms so it's i've kind of been forced to let go of that idea of a healthy physical body and for me this concept of the linga shrira which i wasn't familiar with before i joined the soa has become very important to me because it's the only real vital body that i have um, since my physical body is like consistently deteriorating a little bit so it's that emphasis it's been a complete energetical shift not only in my mind but even physically in the ways that i perceive my own body Uh, on the forum we were actually we had a thread about it and we were speaking about the differences and i actually experienced this phenomenon that i had mentioned um called lermit sign and it's where it feels like electricity is going up your spine. And for me, it manifests in a way that seems like my two bodies are almost splitting. So it it feels like a a really real version of having those two, the physical and the astral bodies kind of coming apart momentarily. And that in itself, as uncomfortable as it is, and that's probably not the medical explanation, it's definitely not. If any doctors are listening to this, they'd be like, that's not what's happening. But for me, I feel like very strongly that that is a possible explanation is that it's just this weird area where those two bodies are just separating momentarily so long story short as i always do um go the long way to get to my answer i definitely have more of a focus on the uh linga shrira now than before many interesting points points there like reminded me how it's often said that uh, people who are not uh, able so to say to live a normal life become the yogis or magicians and uh, of course the first idea that people might have that a magician is someone who is 
superman, someone who has more everything. But uh, in different traditions, it more often comes to that, that some uh, see- seemingly, apparently negative thing in our life uh, sends us that way to seek for that magical occult way of life. Uh, Even though I'm not familiar of having any kind of easy to diagnose physical illness, I definitely know what you mean. Uh, I, I have been experiencing the same kind of problem about my physical body and and how to live in this world it's very ex- extremely hard for me and so it has been all, all my life or since puberty the very uh, demand to choose this more magical um, body centeredness that is linga sharira uh, just living the normal happy healthy physical life is not even an option for me personally be it good or bad or both. I think it's a bit of both. What kinds of ideas come to mind from from the moon in esoteric contexts? I think that's extremely deep question because moon can mean so many things in esotericism. Uh, one interpretation would be that it's always the feminine side which is moon like everything that it's considered uh, as feminine in some symbological system is the moon side it's the left side it's the dark dark side uh, not in a bad way but but in in neutral way but then there is also different meanings for the moon more um more physical um, that brings it to these ener- energetical bodily things and also our subconscious and so on. I, I think it's perhaps the one most deep and hard uh, simple symbol to just like quickly define. Mm. Interestingly also it's one of those things that that very often you come across in in kind of light lighter um, new age type of types of inter- interpretations of spirituality it's very it's, it's a very easy easy symbol to kind of throw throw out there which can then be a turn off for <laughs> for some of us but but it doesn't change the fact that there are very very deep and and complex uh, spheres to this and it's so close to us just today when uh, the first thing I did in the morning I went to a little walk with my sisters who were visiting visiting the city and uh, I saw this beautiful uh, about half moon just hanging in the blue sky and it was like so otherworldly and still present that it was very magical experience and we can always like see to that other world that is the actual physical moon it brings some almost waking dreams when you just gaze upon it Hmm. it's funny that you say that because i was walking with my daughter yesterday through her field at school and exact same thing happened we just looked up and she was the one that pointed it out and she said mom it's daytime and the moon is out it's so beautiful and I was like oh yes and we had that same moment it was you know one of those very poetic moments where there it is you know even though it's eight o'clock in the morning there it is and she's beautiful so it's a nice synchronicity it reminds me of of, uh, of an experience some um, years ago and it was nighttime and I guess it was if it wasn't some I guess that night there was no like <laughs> particular planets visible so it must have been just the moon but like a, some kind of a karma manasic revelation or <laughs> like in, in, intellectual revelation about how or, or a possible explanation like why planets things we see far in the sky 
have have uh, appeared so magical that they are something that even with our physical eyes we can clearly see and even uh, even the moon we can quite clearly even without some binoculars see <laughs> see the craters and and quite quite uh, amazing details on the moon and it's right there and we can see it but there's no way we can physically reach it and it's like a very in your face kind of symbol of otherworldliness <laughs> like planets stars in general it's often very hard to uh, get to people understand uh, when I try to explain that that's like how, how I see the whole whole world just yesterday when we were having the Lucifer Lodge meeting and speaking about this how can this thing called world or universe even exist it's it's a miracle everything here is a miracle but i guess it demands some kind of something going wrong in your head to uh, not to uh, take it as granted but just to be fascinated and terrified all the time just one idea of how uh, masculinity and femininity and all sorts of opposites intertwine I have often thought about this very word Linga Sharira which comes from Sanskrit as said and uh, the moon and the mother all very feminine symbols and feminine feminine things um, but this word Linga is peculiar in this context because as we know it basically means the phallus in in Sanskrit uh, mythos and and language, and this is a very feminine principle, has to do with uh, the body and the moonlight and ether and all that. But still, there is this phallus in in there, and among those myriads of things that I always say that just escape my rational mind, this is very much one of those. That how, how in this principle masculinity and femininity inter, intertwine and why is why is the linga there is just like a question that <laughs> I go back back to regularly considering how those like masculine and feminine polarities are always um, they are the different approaches to this same unity like uh, in the tai chi tu or the yin and yang symbol uh, there is this one symbol and looking from the other way there is uh, yang and from the other way there is yin so i think one good way to think about that would to think that this great field of force that is universe in us and around us is the great feminine the magna mater uh, whom we uh, approach in that hymn uh, then that which is left to us if everything is feminine is the uh, masculine that fits right into that feminine that our energetical self is this linga that is like the Hindus and Tantric Shaivites say in the constant uh, sexual erotic union with that uh, great goddess the shiva and shakti are in like in never ending uh, romantic uh, embrace erotic embrace yeah it must be uh, because of uh, the little that i have read about uh, the shiva and shakti and all this tantric tradition like going going to that has definitely um, invoked or evoked something in me regarding regarding the mother and and uh, I've started to see how everything everything is that said mother basically and I have realized that nowadays when I for example recite the other hymns uh, I tend to also think about the other aspects in relation to the mother in the sense that, for example, 
um, Mars or Kama to which we go next how that is a certain aspect of the mother and how how the mother comes across through that other aspect of course this is just one way to look at the whole whole thing but but it has appeared to be very vital at least personally lately I've never actually thought about it but now you said it that way our modern week starts with the basic feminine and masculine archetypes which can be seen as the uh, microcosm of the all seven like first the feminine moon and then masculine mars which can in for example our star of azazel way of approaching this symbolism to say that they are the magna mater and satan in a way and at the same time shakti and shiva one thing that i was thinking about when you were talking about how shiva and shakti are in a constant embrace was um, another synchronicity within greek mythology how uranus is like perpetually um having sex with Gaia <laughs> as well. Like that's something yeah. that also happens within the Western sphere. So I just thought that was a neat parallel to kind of observe. Uh, and I was also thinking about um, the key, like the the note for the day. I found it interesting that uh, it's in B. And for me, um, B is the natural range that my voice tends to sit in. And I view my voice as being one of my most magical instruments. That's what I do a lot of um, my spiritual work with is with things like music and singing. And so that hymn was most accessible to me because that's in my natural range. And I I thought that that was really interesting right off the bat, getting into things like the keys, and which we haven't touched on yet, but... Yeah, good might be important to note that there's a key for every hymn as well. Yeah, yeah, good point, good point. One one more correspondency. And actually, exactly the same for me. B, B is kind of, it's a note that I kind of quite often naturally go to, or, or B flat, but either of those anyway. It's uh, interesting. I have a like faint recollection that when I played violin badly in in my early youth i really enjoyed that uh, sound of b like mm. it, it was somehow yeah interesting okay maybe i can read the choose to him then so the monday's hymn was him to the great mother and the second in line is choose this hymn to the living vine. My beloved guide, I thank you for your words that kindle hope in my heart. You point and again I climb the stairs like cliffs of the world mountain. You merely look at me and the doors open within my soul. Nihil inimicus hominiquam sibi ipse. Oh, with the greatest joy I pierce myself with this sword, kissing the hilt, and my fingers, unto which the living wine with the color of a garnet gem is shed, are numb already, saturated with joy, changed into the one single eye beholding itself in the depths, filled with brightness. Quia tues magister fortitudo mea, emite lucem tuam et veritatem tuam, hostiam puram, Hostiam sanctam, hostiam immaculatam. Quoniam o quisus eset redemistinos deo in sanguine tuo. Amen, amen, amen. I guess I could start by saying that for me too, it has been for a long time among the least intuitively uh, relatable hymns and archetypes. Mm, but it has once again started to change slowly and it has has to be one of those things that you find that you have a certain uh, idea of something or some ar- archetype and, and then when you go deeper into it you know you realize that you have only seen you have only seen like a small 
part of it and I think for me it started to open uh, with the self-sacrificing theme that you can find there and uh, how it doesn't have to be so warrior-like as we as, as we discussed there are of course many sides to this and also the in the Latin part uh, there are mentions of this holy sacrifice uh, immaculate um, offer that is sacrificed and by his blood he gives us salvation and the idea that it is me who is being sacrificed kind of uh, and especially me in the so-called lower persona's perspective that is giving way to something larger that is growing within me and by that uh, it happens as it said in the in the hymn that tu es magister fortitudo mea meaning master you are my power and comes back to the idea that i have felt crucial crucial personally to see that a lot of the great work so to say is is kind of the lower personas stepping away so that the higher self can can shine again very simplified version but but uh, that's how i've slowly started to see the importance of the importance of the martian archetype what about you your your experiences and ideas uh well, they, this is the not the original one that you had written, right? Like there was another one, if I'm not mistaken, that it was based on. Like it was the same hymn, but it was written previously. Am I wrong in that? Mm. What yeah, kind I'm of trying to find it here. what kind of changes did you notice? Uh, well, there was. Um, I remember discussing this recently in the forum, and. There's a point that I'm going to make regarding it, hmm. but there was another version uh, that I think was kind of the prototype for this hymn that you had posted on the forum, and it wasn't until I had read that version that I was truly touched by the hymn itself, and it was almost like this eureka moment for, for me when I had read that original version of the hymn um, before it became the hymn that the hymn started to almost unlock itself to me, which is interesting to note that sometimes these things, it's again beyond our rational mind, and it's like a very intrinsic spiritual process that happens, almost like little keys that you're given that unlock these bigger things. But it truly wasn't until I read that version that I started to intrinsically understand the hymn or feel like I could get closer to that archetype. Okay, I, I'm I'm very glad to hear that. I I remember what you what you mean. It was originally Obnoxion who asked about the origins of this particular hymn, and in this way it has always been in Phosphorus texts. But before it was a hymn to Martian archetype, it was part of my uh, like how how would you say it uh, way of writing to my diary a certain kind of spiritual um, journey or uh, a short story that just came through me the, not an actual short story written for anyone else but like uh, what I wrote to my my diary I used to write those kinds of like little peaks to some astral realm or how, how should you say it? Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very great to hear that that origin gave you a, a way to approach also the hymn in a more definite or um, opening way. It's it's sad that Obnoxio never got to do those commentaries to the hymns that he was making. I think it was the point of him asking that in the forum 
by the way this uh, hymn to the living wine seems to be the most um, dividing hymn of all like you either love it most or then you don't get it at all i i tend to hear either one of those but not that it's just one of those neutral ones maybe it's a bit similar regarding the whole archetype itself it's mm. martian martian red red uh, principle yeah and i think it might be like we just discussed to be a bit similar with the uh, monday's mother archetype hymn that you either, either love it or you if not hate it but feel it's somehow awkward it might be worth mentioning that the latin latin uh, verse in the middle being nihil inimicus homini quam sibi ipse basically means that no one is such an enemy to himself than man to himself i think it was gotten originally from kikero it might have been and there was recently in the soa forum a lot of discussion about this warrior archetype that is easily um associated with uh, the martian martian principle and i guess it's also one of those those principles that is very easily misunderstood or very easily kind of if you are a very strongly martian personality and you have a kind of a warrior mindset then then i guess it's safe to say that there are more chances of kind of getting carried away by it more than maybe with some other personalities or some other archetypes or at least it's easier to notice that by the others because mm. it's so energetic and outgoing that warrior spirit yeah and it's easy, easy to imagine how this or like sticking a sword in, so in, in yourself and seeing the blood flow can can be also interpreted in very dark ways but but uh, there's a good good opportunity to purify those kinds of urges and and tendencies and try to make them appear in brighter ways in oneself there is also a some hidden ways to see how the star of azazel which basically mean means also the star of mars since azazel is mm, mostly connected to the planet mars uh, how, how that scapegoat symbolism is seen in this hymn uh, how the masculine sword becomes the feminine eye for example it, it doesn't remain in that two-pointed mm, emanation but it becomes once more that round uh, self-beholding eye which is quite rare in the martian hymns this is perhaps most paradoxical of all our hymns of course the of course the friday's hymn is filled with paradoxes but they are so easy to spot that i think people uh, can climb those ladders more easily but here they are a bit more hidden yeah it's funny how how this has been as i said one of the kind of hardest hymns for me initially and then i see that every time every tuesday when i read it it feels that that like it's it's starting to be also one of the most direct ones one of the uh, or how would i say it's it's there are parts in it that that um have started to resonate very strongly and and uh in very direct ways like the like the part that where it says that you point and again i climb the stairs like cliffs of the world mountain like how instantaneously you can be 
kind of woken up from your <laughs> uh, if there are times in your life for example that you just it, it's so hard to see meaning in in things and life is just gray struggling from day to day then it really doesn't take that much if it's if something just clicks right and you are like instantly like a lightning strikes you you are woken up and and it's just that simple in in a way of course it's not that simple at all but 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 sometimes when when you actually manage to like sh- touch that inner master of yours it's it's it can be very instantaneous and striking and also connected to that very idea or experience belongs or belonged when i wrote that text the idea how hard it at the same time is it is like you said like a lightning that masters pointing finger inspiring energy but still those tears feel like you are actually like slowly hardly uh, in a very hard way trying to climb that mountain cliff it's not easy but you can always try to do it it's this old imperative try that the master uses no no more is demanded from us but that is definitely demanded then the sanskrit correspondency is karma which has to do with emotions for example uh, also something that that uh, or things that we are somehow on emotional levels attracted to or repulsed by and uh, i have thought it to be very fascinating this idea of the karma rupa uh, rupa being another word for form or body even this uh, idea that our emotions attractions repulsions create another body uh, like there is a body constituted of our emotions it's a horrible idea in a way uh or in many many ways it doesn't have to be <laughs> i guess but of quite often uh, it's it's it, it show uh, you, you think of negative things when you think of your own karma rupa i was just thinking about uh that um, if you have a desire body so to say isn't that the body that uh br- brings you he- to different hells after you no longer have a physical body because you go where the magnetism goes and if you have negative feelings if you have desires for revenge hatred causing pain that bind you to negative things you are going to feel those things because that's the body you have that's uh, the theosophical way of thinking it and i think they are quite right in this that it's something made uh, from magnetisms that they they have been mm, directed to some points in life and they continue to go exactly that way and that's one selfish reason why we should try to uh, be good uh, send blessings instead of curses could you share something about how you have uh, done esoteric work related to emotions is it important to you yeah i mean i feel maybe this is and this is just something that i'm realizing right now because for me this podcast is as much about learning as it is about sharing but when we're talking about emotions i have difficulty in that realm i think traditionally probably the most Um, out of anything about myself, I struggle the most with my emotions. Like I'm a very sensitive person, um, as many people who know me close know. I'm very sensitive, but I think that the emotional area of myself to me always just seems like a big red ball of confusion. And so I think that perhaps one of the reasons why I have such a hard time 
or have had such a hard time approaching this him is because of those difficulties. And now that I'm starting to apply my spiritual studies to my emotions, perhaps that's one of the reasons why this is slowly unlocking itself to me as I'm working through not only those psychological processes, because before I was thinking about it from a purely psychological aspect, you know, seeing my therapist and trying to sort out all of those things, but it, that helps to an extent, but I think the real key has been for me applying that spiritualism to those emotions, asking myself um, not just what's going on in my mind, but what's going on in my heart in accordance with my mind and how those things um, parallel one another and relate to one another. So eureka moment again happening right now on this podcast. I I think uh, working with your emotions is extremely important for any kind of occultists, but perhaps uh, the tantric approach, by which I mean the approach of trying to open to your feelings, your energies connected to those feelings, both accept them and also channel, control them in a way, uh, is exceptionally important for our uh, Finnish people, us Finns, because we are like sealed vessels, uh, very seldom saying actually aloud our feelings. Uh, we are usually quite uh, slow to interact and and like bottling up those emotions. It's it has been in our culture, and I think that's one reason why, especially we would have to work through those bottled emotions. Uh, Like I always like to say, I I adore those Southern, South uh, European peoples who are more more open to express their feelings, uh, discuss their feelings and uh, shout hatred and then love instantly after that, because it uh, gives gives more flow to all those, uh, also those um, magical spiritual energies. They don't get bottled up so easily. So definitely, I think that the work with karma, astral emotions, is an extremely important part of occultism for anyone, uh, and of course part of it. Is that what you just said? Uh, see, seeing a therapist and uh, seeing also the psychological um, part, but it's best if that's not the only part. Hints of this Finnish mentality our listeners can maybe uh, experience through this podcast. It's a blessing that it's not only two of us here talking, mm. Johannes. So thanks once again for <laughs> for our Canadian savior here opening our bottles but yeah uh, I guess still I can see my own struggles uh, most clearly when it comes to so-called bad feelings and I can see some progress in certain areas in my in my life but but uh, I still really can't handle those very bad feelings, <laughs> which would be the kind of Saturnal aspect in, in the Mars aspect then, and trying to find some kind of a way to manage with that. Okay, next up would be Wednesday's Mercury hymn. Would you read that for us, sister? Absolutely. This one is the hymn to the messenger of the gods. Hear me, O Asboga. Lead me, O guide of souls. You who close to slumber the thousand eyes and open the single one. Teach me, O thrice great Hermes. Enlighten my heart and my forehead and my whole being. O master of wisdom, the natural light, the living water. 
omnia per ipsum factus sunt, Christus mysticus panem nostrum super substantialem, veritas lux via et vita omnium, creaturum ius de Deus, vivaca me, visita me et intellecto meum, et anima meum confirma et instaura, conscientiam meum et clarifica et parga. Amen, amen, amen. Many things come to come to mind already from that. Now, since the among the first words there on this hymn is asboga, it uh, it gives a good um, a reason to ask about these names of uh, spirits that we can find in these these uh, hymns. Could you say something about those in general? Mm, since, you, since you, Johannes, have basically written this, this they prayers. are mostly mostly the common Kabbalistic names for the spirits of these uh, celestial archetypes. You can find them like in Agrippa's three books of philosophy, for example. Uh, these spirits intelligences are like the first servants or ministers of the archetypes helping those archetypes or divinities to manifest in our intellectual and physical energetical world one can once again think them as uh, formulas or entities beings it doesn't matter much. I actually have a relevant question regarding those names. Regarding the rosary practice, then, the final decade, so would that be an appropriate place to, to put those names? I've always kind of struggled with that decade. Uh, do you mean that uh, when you are using the rosary practice and praying for uh, en entities, you choose each day's spirits to pray for them exactly yes yeah you, you can definitely do it that way i haven't personally do it exactly in that way but uh, there is no problem whatsoever and i think it helps one to get attuned to those days those uh, archetypes energies thank you yeah this this hymn then has been one of those very initially uh, easy to approach and relatable. It's a very kind of bright hymn. Maybe not that surprisingly since the common correspondency to Mercury is Bhutti, the Sanskrit term that is uh, not exactly the same as love but the word love has definitely a lot to do do with this and also I have found it very useful how Bhutti has been uh, I guess you could say translated in in the SOA context context as um, sense of unity which also kind of broadens the idea of love as such that it's not an emotion but it's an experience or an experience beyond experience maybe an understanding of of something being a unity and a living living whole that's very important concept for the whole star of Azazel philosophy and one who um, studies Sanskrit terminology from some Hindu or tantric or theosophical approaches uh, might be advised to remember that because Buddhi in itself is more often uh, translated like intelligence or something like that it's more like a abstract core of intelligence in those first 
texts that use that word, but uh, if one considers, for example, how our Buddhists uh, use that word, uh, how in that awakening mind also empathy, love is always implied to exist, one can perhaps more easily understand how important that concept of um, sense of unity is in our system. It's very in the very heart of the star of Azazel. I, like you, I felt closer to this hymn initially um, just by the words themselves. One thing I did struggle with, though, was the concept of the Iokator as the archetype, because I truly didn't know what that meant initially when I first joined. Um, I think that was one of the first things I asked on the forum. What does this mean? Uh and for me, for myself personally, I've come to see that as um, always being mindful of allowing that kind of trickster element to be present within my um, my temperament. I am already kind of like that. I you know, I joke a lot, and I I'm kind of a trickster in that way. But I think I don't. That's more of a an exoteric representation of myself to other people I don't necessarily see that as how I actually am a lot of the time not that it's a deliberate choice but more I guess of uh, like a mechanism that I've formed to kind of be that that person you know when a when a class clown decides to be a class clown that's kind of a, a choice that's often made and so I feel that inviting that into an actual real version of myself, especially since truthfulness is one of the basis or the main principles in the SOA. It's forced me to be honest with myself in how that plays in my own temperament. So that's one way of um, approaching that for myself. So it turned out to be actually quite a difficult hymn <laughs> in, in the long run because it can it forced me to confront my own, um, lying to myself or how I presented myself to others. And also the key is E, and that's a difficult key for me. I, I have the same feeling that uh, this is something that uh, starts easily and then it goes to harder things uh, when time passes. Like um, we have this mer Mercury trickster aspect from many exoteric things like um, thinking about what Sigmund Freud said about jokes, how they uh, open something from our subconscious. And uh, like when I wrote the uh, seven aspects or seven faces of Satan, this book that um, um, approaches all these aspects as, uh, uh, and seven archetypes, as the faces of Satan, it was this particular uh, Iokator or trickster archetype that was uh, the most loved by <laughs> readers who are not always ecstatic of <laughs> my ideas about Satan. It, it somehow seemed to uh, be very understandable even by people who don't always understand why would any sane person worship Satan. This particular idea of the joker, some someone who turns these uh, exoteric mm, normal things upside down, not in order to do evil, but to make some kind of mm, disharmonic beauty or some some kind of humor from that. I got definitely most positive feedback from that trickster aspect archetype of that book. At least somehow intuitively, uh, there seems to be a connection with the trickster and this Hermes or messenger of the gods character, this, well, link between men and gods or, or matter and spirit this bridge between those those worlds why couldn't it look humorous as well mm. <laughs> or, or crazy or just strange 
Yeah, there is humor in every person's life. Some sometimes it's very black, but it's always there, whether you are occultist or not. If you lose your sense of humor, you are going to bad places. Uh, and it seems to be a very persistent archetype in several cultures. For example, now in the recent years when I have studied a little about Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism, I have found this uh, particular Mercury Hermes archetype from Elijah, who seems to fulfill the very same role. And if one's not in interested in going uh, going to Zohar and Kabbalah, he can be found also from Jung's uh, Red Book, where uh, he's a very prominent character, and also that Mercury, Mercury-like, changing, uh, swapping one's emotions and being very volatile and hard to grasp. Yeah, some correspondence is still worth mentioning. Here is mentioned Christus Mysticus, the mystical Christ, and the um, what's the English translation? Here, yeah, what is called in the Latin part "panem nostrum supersubstantialem" or our super substantial bread. Maybe this is not the place to go into that into that in death but but something I'll just mention how this also relates to Christ and uh, the heart's chamber that is again quite quite a common thing in in religions and especially in in prayer work as a channel too now when you said it I think the that particular chamber of the heart is present in some way in all of these hymns and once again, of course, because it's so important to our practice and philosophy. And also we see here um, this super substantial bread that is Christ or spirit. Uh, and the water, living water that is mentioned, uh, they bring us to the fact that through this archetype we find our spiritual sustenance and its highest peak is the kundalini process that's also under the mercury uh, the m m this living water uh, is like alchemists tell us at the same time the living fire that goes through us and both sustains us and uh, changes us. Without trying to give any definite answers, uh, just as an idea and as a question, something to ponder, as opposed to uh, physical bread that nourishes us, like the idea of, of spiritual bread that nourishes us in some other ways, like the question itself, what is that in, in practice, can be a very vital road. Precisely. Thank you again for listening. More info at theserpentandthestar.com.